This is a true Hollywood story about Lana Turner and the golden age of Hollywood. It's a tragedy. It's called Hollywood 1958, Lana, Johnny, and Cheryl. April 4th, 1958, Good Friday, 9.30 p.m. 370 Bedford Drive, Beverly Hills, California. Lana Turner and her boyfriend Johnny are having another fight. That's Johnny Stompanato, a.k.a. John Steele with an E on the end, a.k.a. Johnny Stomp. Bodyguard and chief underling of Los Angeles crime boss Mickey Cohen. This one seems more serious than what has gone before. Johnny is heard to threaten the world famous movie star that he will mess up her face so bad she'll never be in another film and maybe he'll even kill Lana's mother and her 14 year old daughter Cheryl Crane. Cheryl hears all this from her room, one room removed from Lana's bedroom where the fight is going down. She pounds on her mother's door begging them to stop. Lana yells out to her, Go away, darling. It's okay. In a panic, Cheryl runs to the kitchen and finds a carving knife with an eight-inch blade. She runs back upstairs to Lana's door and starts pounding on it, begging them to stop fighting. Suddenly, the door swings open and Johnny Stompanato rushes out. Instinctively, Cheryl pushes the knife forward. It slides all the way into Johnny's lower chest, cutting his aorta puncturing a lung, nicking his spine, nicking his kidney, messes him up. He falls to the floor, gurgling, saying allegedly, Oh God, Cheryl, what have, what have you done? Flat on his back, he slowly expires in a pool of blood on Lana's lovely, expensive white carpet. What to do? Does Lana call an ambulance? Does she call the police? No, she calls her mother. Mother has been managing Lana's career ever since she got signed to a bit contract at MGM in 1937 for $100 a week. Mother, mother always knows what to do. She arrives on the scene, sizes up the situation and calls the studio. The MGM Fixer guy shows up, accompanied by famous lawyer to the stars, Jerry Giesler, the man who got Errol Flynn acquitted back in 43 of that nasty statutory rape charge. Jerry and Lana and the studio guy and mother and Cheryl all get into a huddle to sort things out. Only after this conference and several hours after Johnny took his last labored breath, are the notoriously star-friendly Beverly Hills police called in. They arrive long after midnight, accompanied by the coroner's crew. Statements are taken as Johnny's body is carted away to the morgue. Within a very short time, the place is crawling with representatives of the LA working press. The story goes worldwide within hours. Frightened teenage girl stabs craved gangster to save movie star mom. After some gentle questioning down at police headquarters, naturally with Jerry G on the scene, the brave young girl is released to the custody of her grandmother. Meanwhile, Lana goes into seclusion at a secure, undisclosed location as the world press goes crazy with this latest dollop of Hollywood sleaze and excess. There's never a trial, only a coroner's inquest at which Lana a true movie star, but only a mi uh, mildly talented actress, gives what is later acknowledged to be the crowning performance of her career. They stick with the story even though it is widely speculated that maybe Lana herself did the stabbing while the legal team cooked up the Cheryl story. She's a kid. Worst thing that can happen, she goes to juvenile hall for a day or two and, and there's no consequences as Lana's career is revived big time. And that is what came to pass. 
Johnny was known around town as Mickey C's main enforcer and also as one who had been known to take serious financial advantage of the affection of wealthy ladies of a certain age. He was a World War II Marine combat veteran, survivor of Peleliu and Okinawa, a true tough guy. The word was that Mickey Cohen ordered him to put the suave rush on Lana so he could keep a finger or two in the MGM pie where he already had behind the scenes control of a union or two. Johnny, calling himself John Steele, with an E on the end, started sending Lana flowers and little gifts from his own tacky little Myrtlewood souvenir shop near Hollywood. Pretty soon they were an item, as the saying goes. Then somebody from Studio Security told Lana that her Italian stallion was a racketeer that she must get rid of post haste. By this time, Lana was in too deep and was reluctant to end the affair. Married seven times, she had a reputation as a lady who always had to have a man around and always one that was bad for her. We can relate to that. So they carried on. After a few months, Lana began to see that her big guy had a few deep problems. He was jealous and possessive in the classic Italian macho manner. The calls, the accusations, where did you go? Who were you with? Why didn't you return my calls? Why didn't you pick up? Etc. Etc. Then it started getting physical. He slapped her around some. Lana went to England in 57 to do a forgettable picture with a then unknown co-star, male co-star. Johnny showed up on the set one day, acting nuts, waving a gun around in England for God's sake. The co-star punched out Johnny, took his gun away, and had him rousted out of the UK persona non grata. And who was this new bad hombre? You guessed it, the first future and all-time greatest Bond, James Bond, that's right, Sean Connery. In the classic illustration of textbook codependency, Lana and Johnny weren't quite finished yet. They kissed and made up with torrid love in steamy Acapulco. The studio was very concerned but stood by helplessly, not wanting to get into a hassle with Mickey Cohen. Things came to a head early in 58 when Lana got nominated for Best Actress in her, for her role in the ridiculous, sensational blockbuster hit, Peyton Place. Not only that, they invited her to do a walk-on presenter bit at the awards the first year it had ever run on national TV, handing out the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor to Red Buttons for Sayonara. The studio told her not to show up at the Pantages Theater or to any of the after parties with Johnny under pain of excommunication. She took her mother and Cheryl along while Johnny did a slow burn at home. He beat on her sometime in the next few days after the show and Lana had to go heavier than usual with the sunglasses and makeup. At age 38, she was already showing the adverse effects of years of smoking and drinking. The studio had already cashed out her contract and it was an extremely lucky break for her that she scored that nomination even though she didn't win. You know who won? Joanne Woodward for The Three Faces of Eve. She was actually a real actress. Young Cheryl was Lana's only child. Over the years Lana had suffered several miscarriages and two or more rumored abortions. She didn't do too well in the role of single mother. Cheryl spent most of her childhood before and after the event in boarding schools and at least one mental institution. She was busted several times for various acts of teenage rebellion which always ended up in the back pages of the newspaper, dredging up the whole sordid stabbing story again and again. Finally, at the age of 20, she went to school to study hospitality and restaurant management and became a successful businesswoman working with her father, Lana's second and perhaps only good husband, 
restaurateur Steve Crane. Cheryl wrote her autobiography and stuck with the I still I stabbed Johnny, but I didn't mean to. He kind of just walked into the blade. Geez, what are you going to do? Story. She also revealed that she had suffered sexual abuse at the hands of Lex Barker, Mr. Lana Turner, number four, the guy who played Tarzan in the 1950s. You remember him. Starting at the age of 10 years. When Lana found out, to her credit, she sent Tarzan packing back to the jungle and take Cheetah with you. She claims to have been with Lana when she died of cancer at age 74, but the Latina maid, Lana's best friend from years and years, said Cheryl was far away in Hawaii at the time. Lana left the bulk of her estate to the maid with only a few thousand to Cheryl. Lana's last husband was a stage hypnotist who calls himself Dante. Dante got busted several times for running various cons, including a, <laughs> a mail order PhD business. He, <laughs> excuse me. He claims Lana dumped him after six months when she discovered he had a good rap, hypnotic even, but no money, no money. Lana scored big coin in 1959 by working for minimum scale and taking half the profits for a starring role in a glossy technicolor mess that gets my vote as the worst movie of all time, Imitation of Life. For this Douglas Sirk directed over-the-top extravaganza, Lana walked away with $11 million, and that was big money back then. Big money now, wish I had it. Ironically, both this film and the earlier Peyton Place had late stage Lana Turner playing a woman who had a very troubled relationship with her teenage daughter. Imitation of life, indeed. Postscript. The other night we were discussing this and uh, a couple of young girls came to our little reading group and I asked them, you remember Lana Turner? They're about 20 years old. They never heard of her. And we all got a big laugh out of that because we're all a bunch of antiques. But uh, I got to thinking later, these girls could probably rattle off the names of several stars of today and none of us would have a clue who they were. So it all goes round and round. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it.